Hey, what's up? It's Emily for the Seattle Activist Report. The, uh, the footage I'm about to show you, I took at a local Seattle Campaign for Liberty meeting where the two candidates for sheriff in King County came to speak. They gave in introductions to themselves and um, kind of gave their pitch as to why they're running. And, and afterwards, we asked them a lot of different questions mostly concerning what it means to be a constitutional sheriff. And so um, please give it a watch and make an informed decision in November. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Steve Strand and I'm uh, currently the King County Sheriff. So I am your King County Sheriff and I've been the Sheriff since I was uh, unanimously confirmed by the County Council in uh, April. I uh, came to the Sheriff's Office in 2011. I was asked to join the Sheriff's Office by Sue Rar, who is our former Sheriff, and she recently retired. And uh, prior to that, I was the Chief in Kent. So I have been a Municipal Police Chief for eight years prior to becoming the Sheriff. Uh, I've had a great deal uh, of experience as a law enforcement leader, and I've been a cop for 25 years uh, total. But again, the last eight years, I've been a Municipal Police Chief. And the reason that I came, the reason I accepted this, uh, when Sue asked me to leave a job in Kent that I really enjoyed, I, you know, I really wasn't looking to move, but, but she said, now is a critical time, we'd like you to join the Sheriff's Office, and to bring that outside perspective, as somebody who's worked somewhere else, who's been a municipal police chief, who's run another agency, uh, so that we can begin to really uh, continue that change that she started, because I think we can do better in terms of being effective and being respectful and being accountable in law enforcement. And so again, that's why I'm here. So what we focused in, uh, since I've become sheriff and since I've come to the, sher come to the sheriff's office is on three things. Number first, being number one, being effective. And what that means is that we have to make sure we're doing our business the right way. The reason we exist is to fight crime, to promote public safety. We can only do that if we are also respectful and accountable. But if we're going to be effective, we have to make, make sure we're focusing on what matters in terms of fighting crime and also make sure that our business is being done the right way and we're being respectful of the taxpayer. So we brought in some very innovative strategies to save money, to do our job better, to cut overtime, and we've implemented those things. We focused also on being respectful, and the word that I use, and the word that I use with our deputies, is to carry ourselves with humility. Humility is a powerful word to me. We carry ourselves that way, and that's a value that I think is very important. And finally, being accountable. I've gone face to face, uh, in the in-service trainings with all of our deputies. We have 1,100 employees, almost 700 deputies. I've gone to almost 50 separate training sessions. A lot of work and a lot of time, but it's important to go face-to-face -face and talk to every one of those deputies and say, here's what our expectations are. Carry ourselves with humility. Be accountable for ourselves. Make sure that when we're using force, we're doing it in a respectful and appropriate way. That's really, really important right now. And that is what we have focused on since, uh, since I have taken over. We started those things, and I'm hoping to, to take that baton from Sue Rar and continue that to do even better. Uh, we're also, we also have to build ownership with our command staff. We have to build up our internal investigations unit. There's a lot of challenges we're facing in an environment with not a lot of money right now. But we're doing it, and we're doing it as well as we possibly can. This is about culture change, and that's what we're affecting. I've done that before as an experienced chief who's worked for another department. And our deputies know what we expect. A couple things I would mention to you. This, you know, first of all, this matters. Uh, our budget is almost $160 million, King County Sheriff's Office. $160 million taxpayer dollars. That's a lot of money. 1,100 employees, a lot of people. This is a large law enforcement agency. Covers a lot of jurisdictions throughout King County. This stuff matters, and we have to get it right. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention is I brought with me our new mission statement. This was developed uh, by myself with members of our team in the last year. This is in the lobby of every place you go, every work site at the King County Sheriff's Office, every contract city we work with. It's on everyone's wall. This is the subject of what I went to to talk to all our deputies about, and I, I wanted to point out a couple things to you. Number one, we are respectful, effective, and humble. That is our those are our values because that matters. Another thing I wanted to point out is that it says, it's written up there on the wall for everyone to see. We are good stewards of taxpayer dollars. I use that phrase on purpose. We're stewards of taxpayer dollars. And then finally, we fight crime constitutionally. Because again, that is a value that I want to make sure that all of our deputies carry. I'm really honored to be the sheriff. It's why I'm here. It's why I took this job. It's why I'm seeking this job. I think it's important, and I'd like to continue to serve as your sheriff. 
I believe that I'm very, very qualified. I have a strong rec record of proven leadership. And uh, by the way, I would mention that the Municipal League, which is one group that has taken an objective look at qualifications in this race, they have given me an outstanding rating, the highest rating that uh, anyone can get. I am endorsed by former Sheriff Surar, uh, Dan Satterberg, our prosecutor, uh, also a number of chiefs throughout King County. Pretty much every chief who's given an endorsement has endorsed me because they know my work. Snohomish County uh, Sheriff John Lovick has endorsed me because he knows my work. Uh, what's this going to look like if we do it right? We're going to be a leader in accountability, a leader in carrying ourselves with humility and respect, and we're going to focus on keeping people safe, fighting crime, and doing it the right way. I'm, I'm truly honored to be your sheriff. I'd like to continue to be your sheriff, and I appreciate your support. Thank you. John Urquhart is my name. I'm also running for King County Sheriff. Steve and I are both Scottish. Our family, Steve from Scotland, I have to think we probably live fairly close to each other because neither one of us got the hair gene. <laughs> neither one of us have any hair. That has to go back to Scotland. We're just glad that Dave Reichert is not in this race. <laughs> He's got that full head of gray hair. I've been a, uh, I'll give you a little bit of a history of me and I'll tell you what my vision for the Sheriff's Office. I've lived in King County for 54 years. I've been married for 37 years. I've been a police officer, both full-time and part-time, for 36 years. And I've been with the King County Sheriff's Office full-time for the last 54 years. 24 years, I'm sorry. 24 years, thank you. This is my, my campaign manager down here and his lovely brand new bride. He keeps me on a straight and narrow. Uh, I've been a patrol officer. I've been a master police officer. I've been a sergeant. I've been a plainclothes vice detective, a plainclothes narcotics detective. And I work for both Dave Reichert and Sue Rar downtown in the administrative offices of the Sheriff's Office. And I retired um, about uh, four, five, six months ago. I went to Ingram High School in North End. I went to the University of Washington. I graduated uh, with a degree in business from the business school of the University of Washington. After I graduated, I started a business in Bellevue. I was a wholesaler of electrical construction materials. So I sold wire, conduits, circuit breakers to the electrical trade. I built that business up to about uh, four, or four locations and about 50 or 60 employees. I sold that business, I took a couple years off, and I had my two daughters. And if you've ever been in business, if you've had to make a payroll every two weeks, you know what life is all about. That money just doesn't come in like it does when you work for the government. You have to go out there and you have to sell. I had my two daughters, I went to work full time for the Sheriff's Office 24 years ago. As I said, I retired. I've been gone a month or so, and I started getting calls from people inside the Sheriff's Office from Civilians through to the command staff. And they said, John, you need to come back and run for sheriff. And I said, yeah, like I need a hole in the head. No, seriously, you need to come back and run for sheriff, and here are the reasons. And I started looking at those reasons, and I figured out that the sheriff's office is headed down the wrong road. We are headed down the road where we are going to lose the support of the communities where we police. And by, by losing support, I mean they're not going to trust us. And you don't have to look any farther than the Seattle Police Department because they have lost the support and the trust of the communities where they have to do police work every single day. 34 community organizations, plus John McKay, Mike McKay, and the ACLU went to the Department of Justice and said, hey, there's a problem with the Seattle Police Department. We want you to come in and fix it. And that's what's going on right now. The Department of Justice is into the Seattle Police Department in the, in the city of Seattle. And that's going to be very, very, very expensive and it may or may not fix it. I don't want that to happen in the sheriff's office. So what can we do about that? What are the, what are the ramifications of all of this? What does it look like? Well, I don't want a sheriff's office that has the attitude that we're the police and you're not. And you see that when you drive down the freeway and a patrol car passes you at 75 miles an hour because they're the police and you're not. Or you go to a 7-Eleven store and there's a marked patrol car sitting in the in the uh, handicap spot where he goes in to buy his donut <laughs> and a survey. <laughs> because we're the police and you're not. Or the most insidious example of that is in the community, where the community has ideas about how police work should be done, and we don't listen to them because we're the police and you're not. Don't tell us how to do our job. I think that use of force, force ought to be the last resort, not the first resort. I'm absolutely adamant about that. I don't think that we should be an occupying force in people's neighborhoods. I'm against the militarization of the police, and you see that in the black media used with all the pockets, the black uniforms, the rifles out all the time. 
I don't think people want that either. Yeah. I've got a very special message for this group that I don't think you've ever heard before. But I know it because I've been in government 36 years, really in it the last 24 years full time. Folks, you can't trust the government. You can't trust the government. You can't trust the government to tell you the truth all the time. You can't trust the government not to spin things their own way. You can't trust politicians or anybody in the government, whether a bureaucrat or an elected politician, including the sheriff, not to spin things their way so they look good. Sure. The, uh, and I, th I think the question is about equipment that is provided by the federal government through Homeland Security and a lot of other sources. And you talk about the militarization of law enforcement, and that's been part of it in the last 30 years, and I've seen that in my career. Uh, when you see some of the SWAT equipment, some of the equipment that the officers have, a lot of that is funded through grants, most of which is from the federal government, which comes with strings, and that's well, true. And that is decreasing, not really because of a policy change as much as the federal government doesn't have the money they used to. So some of that is decreasing. But the fact is, as a regional uh, agency, the Sheriff's Office has a lot of that regional equipment and, and access to a lot of those grants. Seattle and, and King County are the two agencies that have most of that. Uh, if you're asking if I'm going to say no to that, the answer is no, I'm not. I think that that is a source that helps us defray expenses. So I'm not going to stand here and tell you that we're not going to continue to do that. What I will say is this. I've had this conversation in front of many groups, Democrats, Republicans, and everybody. I say the same thing to everybody. Um, you, you know, you heard about the drone that Seattle had that was in the, it was in the Seattle Times and the media. That was about, what, three months ago? It's, a, it's small. This isn't like the, the kind in Afghanistan, that, you know, the, the one that you typically think about. This was designed to go up on like a SWAT call or a tactical call to look in a window. The issue is this, we have to be very upfront about things like drones and things like license plate readers. Right now the technology exists and there's departments in this county that can take license plates thousands an hour as the car drives down the road, run those plates, archive where they saw it, where it was and take a photo of every single one of them. Uh, that's, that's not the future, that's right now. And there's cities that have those license plate readers on the streets going into those cities. Uh, you, they have those in ferries right now. And my point is this, we shouldn't let that technology get ahead of us. And the decisions about who gets access to that data needs to be made by policymakers, not bureaucrats. So in other words, it has to be elected officials who have an open, robust dialogue about who gets access to that stuff. Because that, that data is getting ahead of us, I'll be honest with you. And there's so many law enforcement agencies in this country that that, that data is starting to get hit. The technology is getting ahead of the law, is what I'm trying to say. So we have to really pay attention to that. When I talk about the militarization of the police, I'm not talking about the robots and the SWAT teams. I'm talking about the officer on the street who comes to your 911 call or goes to a robbery or work that you see on TV all the time. That's what I'm talking about. The, the type of uniform that throws people off, the militarization look, the soldier look, that's not the look for a cop on the street. That's what I'm talking about. Yes, federal dollars are great. I agree with Steve. Uh, we need that money. question is, how many bomb robots do we need in King County? Because every single little police department, including the Sheriff's Office, State Patrol, Seattle Police, Bellevue Redmond, et cetera, do they need a bomb robot? I don't know. And, you know, just to finish the thought, if, if, if I can finish the thought, though, the guy in the bunker on the hill in North Bend six months ago, uh, he had set bombs in that house, and they sent a robot in to clear it, and I'd much prefer to send a robot in than human beings that work for the Sheriff's Office. Well, the strings that come with it is, you know, they will determine how it will be used, the kind of, depart you know, other departments that you're required to work with, the kind of regional efforts that you have to, have to, you know, respect when you get the equipment. But the fact is, too, I mean, it, any money from the federal government always comes with strings. It always does. And they're going to have some, some determinant on how you're going to be able to operate those things. And they're going to not only limit, but also say, we're going to sometimes take that equipment from you if they need it in certain, certain, certain circumstances. I haven't found it to be a problem, but it, it's something we have to be attentive to. We have a great helicopter. A very nice mm -hmm. Bell helicopter, one of several helicopters that we have. Paid for by the federal government. Billions and millions of dollars. Free, except that you all pay for it, and we all pay for it. It also costs us about a million dollars a year to run the darn thing. Yeah. So that's where some of the money goes. 
Well, as I said, I mean, I, obviously we take the Constitution into, into account. I think that situa I think your question is situational. If they wanted assistance with, with objective documentation so that it could be, you know, examined properly and the facts are known to people, that, that's one thing. But using the office of the sheriff and the resources we have to actually go into direct conflict with an, an arm of the federal government, I don't think is an appropriate It's a pretty that's a pretty extraordinary scenario to tell you the truth. I don't I don't see that happening to tell you the truth. I've got an answer for you. I would not facilitate that as the sheriff. Neither would I. What I'm trying to say is that I stand for the rule of law. That's my job as the sheriff, is public safety, the, the peace of the county. And that's why I sort of come back to, if you're asking me to say that I'm going to get into some sort of armed confrontation with the federal government, no. And the fact is, I am a true believer in, with all the problems with our system, the people are represented constitutionally. If you don't like the way it is, elect different people. Elect different senators and different state representatives. What's more important? I'll ask, I'll ask you that. What's more important, free speech, whether it's like by Seattle or whomever it is, or keeping those windows from Nike Town and the other windows that were broken, about $40,000 worth of damage, what's more important? Because if you want no windows broken, no property damage, if you want the streets to remain open, if I was the Seattle Police Chief, I, I guarantee you I could do that. And what I would do is I'd call in the National Guard, and I'd call in the demonstration manager between the riot troops from every single police department in King County, and I guarantee you there'd be no window breakings, there'd be no traffic disruptions, and there would be no free speech. The two aren't mutually exclusive. You can still uphold the rights of the protesters or the people that are, want free speech, whatever you want to call them, mostly protesters. You can still uphold their rights and stop the property damage as best you can. But what comes first? In my mind, free speech comes first every single time. That's the Trump card. But I'll also arrest anybody that's breaking the law if they're causing property damage, not because they're blocking the street. No, I mean, it's, it's fine to talk about it and say I'm going to do this and everything will be this way because that's how I would do it. It's, it is a messy process, both in terms of I mean, free speech and democracy is messy, and trying to uh, balance those two things and, and the challenge of doing those two things is very difficult. So saying what you're going to do and doing it is two different things and affecting that in a, in a very chaotic environment is very challenging. It really is. So I'm not going to stand here and say, you know, this will always look this way because that's what I, I mean, it, it is a messy process and it's challenging. Of course you want free speech, but you also want people to be able to be heard. And if everyone's shouting at each other, that's not free speech. So, I mean, free speech is a difficult balance to strike, and particularly when there's violence involved. fascism, local governments, in my worry, bigger than the federal government. Under your leadership currently, this has already happened. I'm not talking about protesters. I've been going to King County meetings every Monday, speaking to agenda items, and I'm telling them they're all corrupt. And they've actually started shutting the microphones off. Under your leadership, <laughs> sheriffs have actually removed me from the off. I have freedom of speech. They've allowed me two minutes to speak. They said, out of order. I'm never out of order. I'm a citizen of the United States. I have the freedom of speech. You're not allowed to abridge it. Your sheriffs have removed me. So what are you going to do to change that? And what are you going to do? It's, I'm not a protester. I'm a concerned citizen that thinks our government's on the wrong track. And I tell them this. And they tell me I'm out of line, out of order, and shut the microphone off. So what Great are you question. Yeah. So, so is, I'm just asking what you would prefer. Do you want a longer time to speak? I want my two minutes. They shut me off at uh, 20 seconds in as soon as I start calling okay. me crop. Okay. Sometimes I only speak for a minute and a half, but not my full two minutes. Okay. I've, I've heard what you said. Thank you. So you're going to allow it then to continue because it's under your leadership. And are you going to, if you get elected, what is this? I have freedom of speech as an American citizen. You know, your leadership right now of the, for my First Amendment and Article 5 of the uh, Washington Constitution has been violated. My, my answer is that I will continue to work with the county council to, for them to so conduct meetings that are peaceable. I, I have to do the job. I am the sheriff now, and I'm, like I said, that's my answer.
Awesome. Here's what I want you to do. Do it. <coughs> Once I check. Yeah, exactly. The My office is on the first floor. Come in. Nice to talk to you. Tell me what your problem is. Just like you did now. Tell me about this part. Okay? <laughs> and I will do everything I can to make sure you get your two minutes. I can't guarantee it. Okay? The Constitution does. I, well, I know. But I can't, I can't control. I can't go up there and, and wrest the switch out of their hands. Wrestle the switch out of their hands so you can speak to your two full minutes. <laughs> But I am the sheriff. And stop your dad. And, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm a, a pretty strong-willed person. And when I talk, people listen. And I'll make sure my guys don't wrestle you out of there unless you're causing a disturbance. Okay? Simple as that. Best answer I can give you. And it is one of the unique, it is part of the unique nature of the Office of Sheriff, is it does provide the, the platform and the opportunity to have that robust conversation with people like the U.S. Attorney, the people who deal with the Fusion Center and Homeland Security. And we have a very strong voice, and if that's a, an issue, and that's something we have to talk about, that's, that's something I'm happy to put on my radar screen. So. Your question specifically was, am I going to, my people, are they going to go out and arrest that person X, Y, Z? The answer is no, not without probable cause. And the probable cause that I have might be different than the federal government, but they're going to do. Me, my sheriff's office is not going to arrest that person without probable cause. I used to, I used to be on a, a, a plainclothes narcotics team, like I told you. And we served tons of search warrants. And here's how cops typically serve search warrants. they got a big battering ram. We batter down the front door. And we run in there with, with <coughs> guns out. And yelling, police, police, get down, and you know, we terrorize people doing that. And I did that many times. I got to think, you know, this is really stupid. Yeah, we don't need to do this. So what I started doing with my team is I went and I got a, a pizza delivery outfit and an empty pizza box. I'd go knock on the door. Pizza, we didn't order a pizza. You sure? Can you check? Mind if I come in? And then my team would come in behind me. There's no running in, there's no breaking down the door, there's no drama to it. You don't need, sometimes you do, a lot of times you don't need all that drama. But we're the cops and you're not, don't tell us how to do our job. I, I, I really acknowledge what you're saying. You know, you're concerned about the fact that there's overreaching at different levels of government. I really get that. I really do. And when I answer your questions sometimes and say, you know what, but I'm not going to go there on this. I'm just, I'm not going to stand here and say, say things to you to get you to clap for me and like me, I'm going to be straight. For, I'm going to be straight with you. Okay, I'm going to ask, answer you honestly from my perspective. You know, John talks about, you know, you don't need SWAT team tactics. We don't have to go busting into places. There's some really bad people out there, and you can run down cops and talk about they they all eat donuts and they're all a bunch of idiots and they shouldn't have to do this stuff. The fact is, there's some really bad people out there that are really dangerous, and I'm not going to stand up here as the sheriff and tell you that I'm going to minimize that. Okay, sometimes they have to use tactics that you may not like. Sometimes they have to do things that may bother you. It's when they overreach. I get that, and balancing that constitutional balance is really important to me. I've been a policymaker. I've been a state legislator. I've been a city council member. I totally get it. But I'm not going to tell you things to get you to clap and say, that's funny. I mean, I have to do this job. And these guys are going into very dangerous places, very dangerous places. And going up with the pizza box is it sometimes the right answer, not always. And so again, these are really important topics, and I don't want to demean them by saying things that are, you know, that are disingenuous to you. So I hope that to some extent, because I want to respect your opinion, but at the same time, I'm not going to tell you things just to pander to you. What I'll tell you is, I mean, that's the first oath I took when I became a cop 25 years ago. It's the oath I took when I became sheriff. I mentioned to you that when we created our new mission statement, we fight crime constitutionally, capital C, is something that we specifically added there. So again, when I talk about these other things, I hope you know, of course, it's, it is, it's, the Constitution is our job description. Can you give us an it's example everything of how, we do. You, how you uh, guide your, your troops to, to, to use that, to implement that uh, sure. Constitution? Sure, and it really has to do with how the way that you know the way they conduct themselves day to day, in terms of making sure that you you know the de-escalation of use of force, really good training so that they know exactly what legal uh, interactions are with people. We were finding that some of our deputies 
were ending up using force with people and the initial contact with the person was really not legal. In other words, it was not a constitutional contact in the first place. So we have to start to build the training so that everything leading up to the use of force is also constitutional. It's, again, it goes through all the things we do, our training, our supervision, our review of use of force. It's everything we do. And if I, if I didn't communicate that very well, I apologize. One of the things I'd say in my stump speech almost every time, I'll say it again tonight, I've been a cop for 36 years. I've got a promise not to apply. I've been a cop for 36 years, okay? I know law and order. You can't be a cop for that long and not believe in arresting people and law and order. And if my guys and gals can arrest people that need to be arrested and daisy chain them together and march them into jail, you know, that's fine with me. If they don't violate their constitutional rights, and I say this every single night, if they don't violate their constitutional rights doing it, and we treat them with respect. That's what has to